It just cut me off at the uh, last minute. Sorry, again, I don't understand what's going on with these. You got a completely different phone. You know, and it's... My YouTube features are still very limited compared to what they used to be. But anyways, I'll get right to it. I was showing how in the Bible... Um, how it's probably, probably, anyways, likely that most, if not all, I'm just going to say most, of the uh, prophecies were fulfilled by 70 AD. Now, they call you, oh, it's wrong to, you know, how, it, you know, it's labeled heresy to just even suggest that. Even most prophecies have been fulfilled by the first century. That's how, you know, serious they take this stuff. Some, you know, futurist Christians that, you know, you're a heretic if you even suggest that. You know, the full preterist view. But I was showing passages. My last one I did, I ended off talking about James and how, and talking about the apostles and how it, I was using the Christian, I was using the Christian Zionist argument that when Jesus said this generation will by no means pass away until all these things take place, um, the Christian Zionists will say that, that will, will tell you what that means, and that means that when the nation of Israel is, is, uh, was founded in 1948, that was that prophecy becoming fulfilled, the fig tree uh, parable. That was the fig tree parable uh, being fulfilled. So... They interpret this generation as the generation that sees that saw Israel reborn in 1948 as the sign, the fig tree sign, anyways, of the final generation. And so they interpret that generation will not pass away until all these things take place. And I was going over how the apostles not not only said nothing of that in any of their letters, even though it's a vitally important subject, it would have been a vitally important subject. It certainly would have made sense for them to put it in there just in case some quote-unquote replacement theologist wanted to, you know, manipulate Bible prophecy as, you know, or manipulate the Bible as Christian Zionists claim to assure everybody that, that, you know, Israel is, the nation of Israel is still of importance. As a reminder of that anyways. But you, no, they didn't do any of that. They talked about the heavenly land. They, uh, Hebrews... Chapter 13, to Jews, to the tribes of Israel. Here on earth, we have no continuing city, but we seek the one to come, the heavenly Jerusalem. And how James, who, which was written to the 12 tribes of Israel, mentioned nothing about the re-establishment or regathering of national Israel or Jerusalem. Talked about the coming of the Lord being soon, being imminent in their day, right before, prior to AD 70. James chapter 5, 7 through 9. And so I'm moving on to here to finish off here with Peter. Now you remember in Hebrews chapter 10 verse 37 how the author there, many believe it's Paul and I do too, um, that in a little while he who is coming will come and will not tarry, assuring the readers of their day, almost 2,000 years ago, that in a little while Christ is going to come to relieve them of their troubles. Okay? Peter, you find the same thing. First Peter. First Peter chapter 1 verses 3 onward. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who, according to his abundant mercy, has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you. Now, many of this audience were Jews, obviously, not reserved in any physical land, but notice it's reserved in heaven for you, but that's beside the point who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. In verse 6, In this you greatly rejoice, though now, listen to this very carefully, though now, for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials, that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Okay, so notice how 
1 Peter chapter 1, verses 6, very similar to Hebrews chapter 10, verse 37. Now, the author of Hebrews... Okay. Talks about the same thing. Okay. Hebrews 10, before that... 30, verses 32, but you recall the formal day, the former days in which after you were illuminated, you endured a great struggle with sufferings. Partly while you were made a spectacle, both by reproaches and tribulations, and partly while you became companions of those who were so treated. For you had compassion on me in my chains, and joyfully accepted the plundering of your goods, knowing that you have a better and enduring possession for yourselves in heaven. Therefore, do not cast your confidence, which has great reward. So he's assuring them that the trials that they're going through, but do not cast away your confidence. Do, do not endure. You know, endure. Because it has a great reward. For you have need of endurance, so that after you have done the will of God, you may receive the promise. Quote, for yet a little while. I'm gonna, can't stress that enough. For yet a little while. And he who is coming will come and will not tarry. Book of Hebrews and James were written prior to eighty seventy. Just saying. Do I just forget that? Same thing here in First Peter. Persecution. It only lasts for a little while. To the coming. Uh, the honor, glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Notice that Peter says this is the testing by fire. Now, the testing by fire you can find in Old Testament passages as being the, the part of the birth pangs before the coming of Christ, before the coming of the Lord, before the day of the Lord. And you can find that again in Zechariah. So what did he say? That the genuineness of your faith being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So he's mentioning the testing by fire. Um, so you can find that in um, Zechariah chapter 13, I believe. Yes, yeah, so this is verse 7 here. Zechariah 13, 7. Awake, O sword, against my shepherd, against the man who is my companion, says the Lord of hosts. Strike the shepherd, and the sheep will be scattered. Then, then I will turn my hand against the little ones. So Strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. So it's talking about the, the, the killing of Christ and scattering his sheep. But notice, this is interesting, then I will turn my hand against the little ones. And it shall come to pass in all the land, says the Lord, that two-thirds in it shall be cut off and die, but one-third shall be left in it. I will bring the one-third through the fire will refine them as silver is refined and test them as gold is tested. They will call up my name and I will answer them. I will say, this is my people, and each one will say, the Lord is my God. And then in 14, it goes over the, the Jerusalem being, you know, taken, calling out the day of the Lord. But anyways, the reference verse here is 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 6 and 7. So, again, Peter was saying he was living in that time. He, remember, after all, if this was just a long series of never-ending historical situations that Christians have to go through as if the purification, you know, nothing to do with, you know, birth pangs that were, you know, imminently close to the coming of Christ, you know, you know that were evidence of the how close they were of Christ's coming. No, uh, most, that's how most Christians would probably uh, understand that as, that. Now, Peter's talking about the never-ending persecutions and tribulations, everyday things that Christians have to go through for the past 2,000 years. But Peter isn't saying that. Peter said, for now, for a little while. Let's go back to that. First Peter, now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials, talking about the testing by fire. So he was saying he was in that end times persecution. And he verifies that. He said that Christ was um, manifested in these last times for you. Well, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 20. Well, Hebrews said that too. Hebrews said that um, in Hebrews 9, 26. Let's 
see if I can get it here. Hebrews 9, uh, 26. He then would have had to suffer often since the foundation of the world, talking about Christ. But now, once at the end of the ages, he has appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. So he, according to the Hebrews and Peter, they both agree that he came in the land days, he came in the last days, the end of the ages. And so not only did they believe they were in the last days, but they believed that the coming of Christ, they both agreed that the coming of Christ was going to be in a little while. To relieve them of the current tribulations and persecutions they were going through. And to verify that even further, he says in 1 Peter 4, 7, But the end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be serious and watchful in your prayers. And further it says in 1 Peter 4, 17, For the time has come for judgment to begin at the house of God. And if it begins with us first, it will be the end of those who do not obey the gospel of God. So again, I would have to ask, was he confused? Did he mistake what happened in Jerusalem in 70 AD as the coming of the Lord but was just mistaken about it Jesus didn't you know, the Holy Spirit didn't reveal to him that that wasn't the coming of Christ because this is another book by the way that was written just prior to that so again you have this too where 1 John 2.18 again I know people argue since this book was supposedly written in AD 90 you know, 20 years after AD 70, that this, he couldn't have been about AD 70 because he's saying 20 years later that it is the last hour. Well, to me, that would kind of make John, I mean, did the Holy Spirit lie to him too? I mean, I'm, I'm not trying to say that for sure, but I mean, come on here. First John 2.18, little children, it is the last hour. And as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now, Many antichrists have come, by which we know that it is the last hour. He was saying that they knew that because of the sign of the many antichrists around them. I don't think verses like that should be overlooked. Because what did Jesus himself say in Luke chapter 21, verses, uh, verse 8? He said that... Um, Take heed that you not be deceived, for many will come in my name, saying, I am he, and listen to this, the time is drawn near, therefore do not go after them. Luke doesn't mention in this verse false apostles, but in other books they mention false apostles. I do believe that these are in the same category, though, not just false messiahs, but people also coming in his name, too. False apostles saying the time is drawn near when it hasn't. Does that make John, Peter, Paul, James, these people that Jesus warned about? They all said the time is drawn near, and if the time is drawn near when it hasn't, there's a reason why Jesus said that, right? Look it up, Luke 21, verse 8, and look at all the apostles saying that the, that the coming of Christ was at hand and near. He says that there'll be people prematurely saying the time is drawn near. Don't listen to them. Don't follow them. But then he says later on in Luke 21 that um, in the fig tree parable, in verse 31, So you also, when you see these things happening, know that the kingdom of God is near. So he didn't leave them in, confu in, in, he didn't leave them in any confusing, confusing message. He answered their questions. Luke 21, 7. So they asked him, saying, Teacher, but when will these things be? The days will come in which not one stone shall be left upon another that shall not be thrown down. That's what they're talking about here with these things. And what sign will there be when these things are about to take place? What's further interesting about Luke 21, however, before I, you know, go off into the other things, is that Luke 21, verses 20 to 23, uh, or I'm just going to say 22, is very interesting. 97% of Bible scholars agree that this is a this is the AD 70 event. Futurists have to make this the AD 70 event because of the verse uh, verse 24. They will fall by the edge of the sword and be led away captive into all nations. And Jerusalem will be trampled by Gentiles 
until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. So they got to have that in there. So they can't have that. They can't make that be anything other than eighty seventy. So this is clearly a, the eighty seventy event here. But when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then know that its desolation is near. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains, and let those who are in the midst of her depart. Let not those who are in the country enter her. Verse 22. For these are the days of vengeance, that all things which are written may be fulfilled. I'm going to repeat that again. For these are the days of vengeance. What are these? When they see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, the desolation of it is near. That same desolation where they will fall by the edge of the sword and be led away captive into all nations and be trampled by Gentiles, etc. Jesus said that those would be the days of vengeance that all things which are written may be fulfilled. Now, I just don't know what to make of that. I don't ignore stuff like that. Some people would gloss over that and say that, well, he, that don't mean anything. Days of vengeance, all things written. Old Testament talks about the days of vengeance before the day of the Lord. Now I'm going to get into that. So what are these days of vengeance that he's talking about? So we already went over the apostles saying the coming of Christ is soon, how the whole you know, Christian Zionist argument that Matthew 24, 34, this generation shall not pass. You know, their whole argument that that means Israel founded again as a nation post-70 AD is completely false, completely not in the New Testament Bible. Falls to the ground, has nothing but holes in it. Covered that. Now I want to cover what are these days of vengeance that Jesus is talking about. Well, for starters, let's go to Isaiah, the very beginning of Isaiah. You know, um, you can read Isaiah in the very first chapter. It talks about Israel being disobedient and being sinful, forsaking God. Verse 10 of Isaiah 1, it says, Hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom. He's referring to Jerusalem here. Give ear to the law of our God, you people of Gomorrah. To what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices to me? I have had enough of burnt offerings of rams, and the fat of fed cattle, I do not delight in the blood of bulls or of lambs of goats, or of goats. And so he's warning them that, in verse 13, Bring no more futile sacrifices, incense is an abomination to me. The new moons, the Sabbaths, and the calling of assemblies, I cannot endure iniquity in the sacred meeting. There are new moons and your appointed feasts my soul hates. They are a trouble to me. I am wary of bearing them. When you spread out your hands, I will hide my eyes from you says there in the very last verse in verse 15 anyways your hands are full of blood telling them to wash themselves make themselves clean wash yourselves make yourselves clean put away the evil of your doings from before my eyes cease to do evil learn to do good seek justice weak the oppressor defend the fatherless plead for the widow and it goes on that if you do not do that I'm, wrath is going to come on me. so verse 2 it talks about the latter day mountain should come to pass in the latter days. But anyways, chapter 3 is very interesting, for it talks about, For behold, the Lord, the Lord of hosts, takes away from Jerusalem and from Judah the stock and the store, the whole supply of bread and the whole supply of water, the mighty man and the man of war, the judge and the prophet, the diviner and the elder, the captain of fifty and the honorable man, the counselor and the skillful artisan and the expert enchanter. I will give children to be their princes and babes shall rule over them. The people will be oppressed, everyone by, everyone by another and everyone by his neighbor. The child will be insolent toward the elder and the base toward the honorable. So I'm going to go, I'm going to skip a few just to get to the point here. So he's warning them that they're sinful and he's getting angry with them. How he's going to pour out his wrath on them. Verse 16 of Isaiah 3, it goes, Moreover, the Lord says, Because the daughters of Zion are haughty and walk with outstretched necks and wanton eyes, walking and mincing as they go, making a jingling with their feet, therefore the Lord will strike with a scab the crown of the head of the daughters of Zion, and the Lord will uncover their secret parts. In that day, usually in Old Testament prophets, in that day usually means the day of the Lord, 
In that day, the Lord will take away the finery, the jingling anklets, the scarves, and the crescents, the pendants, the bracelets, the veils, the headdresses, the leg ornaments, the headbands, the perfume boxes, the charms, the rings, the nose jewels, the festal apparel, the mantles, the outer garments, the purses, the mirrors, the fine linen, turbans, robes. And so it shall be, instead of a sweet smell, there will be a stench, instead of a sash, a rope, instead of well-set hair, baldness, instead of a rich robe, a girding of sath cloth, and branding, instead of beauty, your men shall fall by the sword, and your mighty in the war, sounds like Luke 21. Her gates, Jerusalem gates, shall lament and mourn, and she being desolate shall sit on the ground. And in that day, this is Isaiah 4, seven women shall take hold of one man, saying, We will eat our own food and wear our own apparel, only let us be called by your name to take away our reproach. In that day the branch of the Lord shall be beautiful and glorious, and the fruit of the earth shall be excellent and appealing for those of Israel who have escaped. Verse 3, and it shall come to pass that he who is left in Zion and remains in Jerusalem will be called holy. Everyone who is recorded among the living in Jerusalem. That's the, sounds like the book of life there. So what do we have so far? Jerusalem being desolated. In that day. At the time of what? The time of the branch of the Lord being established. And the time that we have the recording you have the preservation of everyone recorded in the book of life. Verse 4, When the Lord has washed away the filth of the daughters of Zion and purged the blood of Jerusalem from her midst by the spirit of judgment, listen to this, and by the spirit of burning. Sounds like kind of what happened in AD 70 with the fires and the burning of the temple. Sounds like it, just saying. By the spirit of judgment and by the spirit of burning, then the Lord will create above every dwelling place in Mount Zion. After that, after the judgment of Jerusalem, after the desolation of Jerusalem. Vengeance. Then the Lord will create above every dwelling place in Mount Zion and above her assemblies a cloud and smoke by day and the shining of a flaming fire by night. For over all the glory there will be a covering and there will be a tabernacle for shade in the daytime and from the heat. That's the tabernacle. Then in chapter 5 and 6, it goes on it about burning the vineyard, burning it down. You can read that, but I kind of want to get to the more juicy, because it's, Jesus spoke about the days of vengeance, that all things written may be fulfilled. Okay, so we have days of vengeance. <clears throat> I'll start at Isaiah 64. Starting at verse 10, because I believe it's important to get that in context before starting at 65, Isaiah 65. Verse 10, Your holy cities are a wilderness. Zion is a wilderness. Jerusalem a desolation. Our holy and beautiful temple, where our fathers praised you, is burned up with fire, and all our pleasant things are laid waste. Will you restrain yourself because of these things, O Lord? Will you hold your peace and afflict us very, and afflict us very severely? Okay, so they're asking him that. They're asking him if he'd restrain himself. What's going to what are you gonna do? Isaiah 65, here's his response. I was sought by those who did not ask for me. I was found by those who did not seek me. I said, Here I am, here I am, to a nation that was not called by my name. I have stretched out my hands all day long to a rebellious people, talking about his old covenant people here, who walk in a way that is not good according to their own thoughts, a people who provoke me to anger continually to my face, who sacrifice in gardens, burn incense on altars of brick, who sit among the graves, spend the night in the tombs, who eat swine's flesh, and the broth of abominable things is in their vessels, who say, keep to yourself, do not come near me, for I am holier than you. These are smoke in my nostrils, a fire that burns all the day. Verse 6. Behold, it is written before me, I will not keep silence, but will repay. Vengeance. Days of vengeance here. Even repay into their bosom. So he's repaying Jerusalem here. And he will, the time will come when he will repay them. Verse 7, your iniquities and the iniquities of your fathers together. And you remember in Matthew 23, if you're familiar with the, with this passage, Jesus said that, um, let me go back to here. 
try to get to it quick. Hang on. Okay. Where Jesus said that um, in verse 32, he was talking about how they were witnesses, the Pharisees, the Jewish leadership of his day. Verse 31, Therefore you are witnesses against yourselves that you are sons of those who murdered the prophets. Verse 32, Fill up then the measure of your father's guilt. And Paul said a similar thing in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 where he said, Filling up the measure of their sin as always. But fill up then the measure of your father's guilt. And he's so he's really... Um, Echoing Isaiah 65 here, where he says that I'm going to repay the iniquity and the iniquities of your fathers together. Isaiah 65 7. If I burn incense on the mountains, blaspheming on the hills, I will measure their former work into their bosom. So he goes on in verse 8 As the new wine is found in the cluster, and one says, Do not destroy it, for a blessing is in it, so will I do for my servants' sake, that I may not destroy them all. So he's going to destroy them all except for a remnant. I will bring forth descendants from Jacob and from Judah, and heir of my mountains. My elect shall inherit it. Now that's that latter-day mountain. Well, that latter-day mountain in Hebrews is talked about as a spiritual heavenly mountain versus the physical one. I'm not coming to that mountain. So that's the mountain that they're going to inherit, if you use the New Testament as a reference to this. My servant shall dwell there. Sharon shall be a fold of flocks, and a valley of acor, a place for herds to lie down for my people who have sought me. But you have been those who forsake the Lord, forget my holy mountain. He goes on in verse 12, Therefore I will number you number you for the sword. In some passages, therefore I will destiny for the sword. And ye shall all bow down to the slaughter, because when I called, ye did not answer. When I spoke, ye did not hear, but did evil before my eyes, and chose that in which I do not delight. Therefore, my, thus says the Lord God, Behold, my servant shall eat, you shall be hungry. My servant shall drink, you shall be thirsty. My servant shall rejoice, you shall be ashamed, my servant shall sing for joy of heart. You shall cry for sorrow of heart, a will for grief of spirit. Have you read the be, uh, the Beatitudes? I believe you pronounce it that way in, in Luke's version, where Jesus says that blessed are those who you know mourn, for they shall no longer mourn. But woe to you who laugh, for you shall mourn. You know he you know, goes from blessed are those and woe to those. In Luke 6, I, I read that and I finally got what he was doing. He was, again, taking from Isaiah 65. And he was fulfilling that. He was basically making that be in a fulfillment here with Christ coming to his people in the first century. That this is it. But anyways, you shall well for grief of spirit. You shall leave your name as a curse to my chosen... For the Lord God will slay you and call his servants by another name. So that he who blesses himself in the earth shall bless himself in the God of truth. And he goes on, but he says, out of doing this, 17, For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former shall not be remembered or come to mind. But be glad and rejoice forever in what I create. For behold, I create Jerusalem as a rejoicing and her people a joy. So notice how he... You know, you get the creation of the new heavens and new earth. Then he associates that with the creation of the new Jerusalem. You know, he creates the new heavens and new earth. He creates the Jerusalem. So it really, when you read this text, it suggests that creating the new heavens and the new earth is creating the new Jerusalem. is by destroying the old Jerusalem. I mean, it does make sense when you follow that, when you make that connection. Am I saying it's 100% true, 100% right? I, I'm not a complete expert, but from what I showed so far, it makes sense. Jesus said, these are the days of vengeance, the days of what? When Jerusalem will be surrounded by armies, the Roman armies, desolated. These are the days of vengeance that all things written may be fulfilled. Well, here you have Isaiah 65 talking about the destruction, that very destruction, what appears to be that very destruction, and he's saying, because of vengeance, because of all oh, these sins, I'm gonna, they're going to be filled up, the iniquities and the iniquities of your fathers together. And out of that destruction will come the new heavens and new earth, will come the new Jerusalem. And I can go on and on. There's also, and I also pointed out in Isaiah chapter 3 and 4, that, that the Jerusalem being desolated, 
destroyed is also the day of the Lord there. The day that the uh, you have the judgment, the books open, or the book of remembrance. You also have that tabernacle established after that destruction of Jerusalem in Isaiah chapter 4. So it does make complete sense. It makes complete sense to me that that like I said, either most, if not all, Bible prophecy fulfilled in the first century. And that's important because what they're telling us is Bible prophecy might just be deception by our enemies, by the Illuminati Brotherhood to pacify us, the believers of those prophecies, to accept you know, what's going on as Bible prophecy rather than actually opposing it. You have Amos talking about that too. Matter of fact, I don't think I have enough time because I'm already at 30 minutes and this video will probably stop at any time so I probably shouldn't. So I guess I'll go on. Maybe tomorrow I'll do another one, a continuation off this. I've done other videos, but I want to make sure I keep drilling this home and because this is what I originally sought out to want to do was to show how what they're saying is Bible prophecy happening around us is really just another deception. And um, why we shouldn't trust that. I did a video showing in one of the Hollywood movies, which we know is run by the Illuminati, Resident Evil, the final chapter, I believe it's that one, where you have that secret society talking about staging an apocalypse using the Bible um, by also unleashing a virus. And then, um, yeah, pointing to the Bible. It's been done here. We can do it again. You know. And also that X-Files movie, too. The first one that came out in 98, you had the reference to the elite staging an apocalypse. You had another um, person mentioning that uh, character in that movie, mentioning that to Mulder. So yeah, I think it's pretty clear, and I want to make that pretty clear. I want to make it clear that all this coronavirus stuff, while it might be their end game, and there might be a lot of bad shit coming our way, um, if they're pushing this stuff as Bible prophecy, I wouldn't fully trust it. Who do we believe? Do we believe the words in the Bible, or do you believe the words of men? People are already showing their true faith, their true colors, when you see churches that are, you know, splitting up and complying with the no more than ten people in a room rule. They're already declaring that, they're already declaring the world over Christ. So, and unfortunately many people who are into this Stuff and I'm not saying all do will eventually fall, I think, for the deception of the world because they're, I think, maybe they don't, some don't realize it, but their eyes are set on things of the world because that's the kind of kingdom that they're waiting for the kingdom of this world that'll be brought about through the ways of the world, through force. Jesus is going to come literally with sword, and he's going to rule the world literally with rod of iron become world dictator I heard many Christians say that new world order in Jerusalem but I'm thinking that no that's just another deception of the Knights Templars working through the various fraternity fraternities comprising the whole body of adepts known as the Illuminati to deceive the world um Take care. I'll make another video probably tomorrow on this.